This is the TSG Multimedia Podcast for April of 2021. We're sponsored this month by Soundtracks, Automatic, and the TSG Train Crew on Patreon. Thank you very much. I'm your host, John of Atticola, and I have news from last month, the Soundtrack Soundbite with George Bogatuck, information about upcoming programs, some exciting news about the Pacific Coast Region's annual convention, an interview with Daylight Dave Houston, responses to viewer comments from the past month, and some great photos on our catch of the month. Before we get to all that, please remember to hit the thumbs up icon to register your support of what you're watching. It helps the channel become more visible, and it also lets me know that you appreciate what we're doing here. Leave a comment in the comment section below. That also helps me know if you like what you see on the channel. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you can help support my work on this channel by becoming a part of the TSG train crew. That's what I call our supporters on Patreon. It's as cheap as two bucks a month and it helps bring the content you enjoy to the channel. Another way to support the channel is to click on the branded merchandise just below the video player on your computer screen if you're watching on a computer. Get yourself a t-shirt, a coffee mug, a phone case, or whatever else strikes your fancy. There's a lot of cool stuff on there that I've worked pretty hard to design, so enjoy. So let's get to our soundtrack soundbite for this month. All right, I got George dialed up on Zoom. Welcome back, George. How's it going? Hey, John, everything's going well. I hope you're having a good day out there in sunny California. Um, oh, yes. We've got a little bit of uh, snow going into town right now. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> That's the white cold stuff that falls out of the sky and makes everything cold. Yeah, I mean, we get that in our mountains, but I haven't seen that around here in a long time. No, actually, oh, we, wow. it, where, where I live, there are some mountains that get a little bit of a dusting once in a while. And there was some recently. So I know what you're talking about. Uh, but since probably most of this week, though, it's been perfect. I spent two and a half hours on a hike yesterday. It was great. Oh, wow. That would be so nice to be able to spend 15 minutes outside without uh, <laughs> getting freezing. But hopefully next week it'll blow out of here and maybe we can actually start having a real spring. Cool. All right. Well, what's up with you and soundtracks this month? Well, we've got a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. I saw that you uh, interviewed Nancy last time. So that was a great interview. Good job. You guys did really well. But as she mentioned, we have some new products that are going to be coming out uh, during the, the next few months. And so our TSU Next 18, which will be a Next 18 drop-in plug-in decoder, and then our new Tsunami 2 drop-in decoder to replace the Bachman sound value. It'll be a direct footprint replacement. The wires will patch up exactly the same way. It'll literally be a drop-in fit. So we're really excited about those, but unfortunately due to some electronic parts delays, we're kind of running a little behind the eight ball right now. Um, but as of right now, we're projected to have those hopefully on the shelf either by the end of April or not too shortly after that. So cool. Pretty excited about that. That'll be uh, coming soon. So make sure you guys are subscribed to our newsletter for updates on the new stuff as it comes out. Yeah. Plus, so, I'm sure we'll talk about them when they come out, right? We'll talk about them. Oh, absolutely. Lights. Absolutely. We'll probably bring them up next month. We'll hopefully I'll have boards in front of me to be able to show you. Right on. So, but really what I wanted to bring up this month is one of the questions we get is, you know, well, which decoder fits into what steam locomotives? And we get this question all the time. And the reason I brought this up was I actually found a advertisement from a uh, well-known uh, goalie hockey gear equipment company that showed the number of customized colors and, and combinations that you could do with their equipment. Um, of course, as you know, I play hockey, so I see a lot of this stuff as well. And I thought it would be a good time to bring up the steam decoder because especially for example our tsunami 2 steam there are lots of sounds in the decoder that are already pre-programmed that you select using your throttle or your command station using cvs to determine which sounds play now this is the whistle the bell the exhaust chuff the air compressors and so forth but the interesting thing was this uh the gully gear equipment, I think they said there were like 13 million possible different combinations. And I just kind of, <laughs> uh, that's nice. Because 
how many combinations would you suspect that we have in here? And I'm just going to kind of start rattling off. We've got 90 whistles to choose from, 54 bell recordings, 10 exhaust chuffs, 10 air compressors, eight dynamos. We've got other sounds such as injectors. We've got other sounds like uh, the uh, Johnson bar and other stuff like that. So what would you think would be a, a good guess at how many possible combinations? Uh, well, I'm not really good with, with math. <laughs> so uh, it's a lot though. I, you know, I think you told me once when we looked at steam decoders before and I thought it was in the billions, but I don't really yep. recall. Is it? Yep. So we have 2.1 billion possible sound combinations in our Tsunami 2 steam decoder. That's a lot. Um, and, and so this is where we talk about now, I'm not adding volume control. I'm not adding reverb or echo, and I'm not adjusting the sound effects in any way. I'm just looking at the sound effects and the selection because you have two injectors, you have two uh, Johnson bars, which is the direction switch. Basically, mm -hmm. you, it allows the engineer to adjust the direction of the locomotive. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, the articulated exhaust chuffs. So I am including that. And the exhaust chuffs are set up in such a way that an articulated, you can have no wheel slip, slow, medium, and fast. And that's the sound of the two sets of drivers going in and out of sync with each other. Right. Um, you also have a three cylinder sound that you can reproduce. So when it comes to locomotive profiles, you have all those sounds built into it. So you can take the same decoder, install it in this small little American 440, and you'll get the light single, ch single ch chime whistle, wood burning locomotive. So you get sounds that correspond to a wood burner. And, you know, and then you have a hand rung bell. Whereas when you get to a big heavy locomotive like this, you have coal burning locomotive back here. You have the uh, a dynamo, which is a steam driven electric generator. And right. there's different versions of it. And you have all these different sounds on here and you can adjust a he much heavier chuff. Now, one of the advantages of the Tsunami 2 in general, just overall of anything else is there's 16 independent sound channels that will play sound. So our decoder doesn't have to prioritize certain sounds over others when they're playing. So like, say for example, there's some of our uh, competitors products out there that when you hear the air compressor, which is right here on the side, when you push the button to turn it on, which actually it runs based on a governor. So you wouldn't actually flip a switch. But if you have the air compressor on and then you go to ring the bell, the air compressor sound mysteriously disappears. The reason is because they have limited sound channels. And so when it comes to our uh, Tsunami 2 decoders, you can hear the bell play, you can hear the air compressor play, you can hear the auger running the coal back up into the locomotive, you can hear the dynamo, you can hear the blower, you hear all those sounds so you get the more realistic experience of what it would be standing next to a steam locomotive. Um, I know for those of you guys who've been to Durango, you know we are blessed by being able to live right next to a whole bunch of uh, steam locomotives. And so when it really comes to steam, we fully understand how these locomotives work. And so there we put that effort into the uh, production of the Tsunami 2 to more realistically give you that experience. Right. So when you hear all these appliances all over the locomotive, you're actually going to hear them in real time versus prioritizing certain sounds over another. Yeah, one of the cool things about steam engines is that it's how many different sounds they make. I mean, you could sit or stand next to one and I couldn't even identify all this. I mean, the dynamo is obvious. It has that high mm -hmm. whining pitch that that ramps up. Uh, you know, that that's an obvious one. You know, whistle, mm -hmm. obviously. But uh, there's a lot of stuff going on that I don't even know what it what they are. I guess, you know, I guess people who work on them know everything. And if something's not working right, they can hear it. Yes. But uh, I know what you're talking about, though. There are a lot of sounds. And having there are a 16, lot of sounds. Yeah, having 16 channels, I think, should cover most of them. Of well, we intelligently having... went through and analyzed what the steam locomotive was so that we could make sure that we had enough channels for all the sounds you would hear potentially at one time. Yeah. I mean, there are some prioritizations going on, like say, for example, when your locomotive is stopped, we actually have a fireman Fred feature where he'll actually walk around and check the frame. And what he's doing is he's kind of knocking on the, on the metal and you'll hear that. And usually if they're hitting on it with a metal, you'll hear a resonance if there's a crack. Oh, that's so funny. That's so what it he's simulates doing. a crack too? Well, so it simulates him searching for a crack. Yeah. So is he hitting stay bolts or something? What's the... Um, he's just kind of running along here and knocking on the frame and just kind of hitting against it and listening for it. 
oh, listening so for funny. that resonance. If he doesn't hear it, he'll, if he hears something, he'll go back and do it again. And then that's when he'd say, okay, I need to go in and look. And then that's when they'll start climbing in and looking at it. Right. But making these locomotive profiles is really simple. So I'm going to unmute this, uh, this Mikado right here. And I can play the whistle here. You can hear that whistle coming through fairly cleanly. Yep. Now, all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to change CV number 120. That's CV number 120. And I'm just going to pick another number. I'm just going to pick a random number. So we're going to pick whistle number 87. I have no idea what it is, but we do have a full roster of what those numbers mean on our website at soundtracks.com. Right. But now when I blow the whistle. It's different. You hear a different whistle. And so if I go back and do it again, same thing. I'm just changing CV 120 on the main line here. Yeah. And you can just sit there and make all these different changes uh, on the fly while you're running your locomotive or just after you set it up. So you don't have to sit in front of a programmer and go through and search pages and pages of profiles. You make a couple of CV adjustments and you're on the road and you're playing with your trains and, you know, because the, the, the impression that all these different pages of profiles are giving you all these choices is doing not much more than what we've done here. The only difference is, is they've built this profile and claim that it's this locomotive or that locomotive. And so here you just go through and make some adjustments. So if you don't like the whistle, or if you want to change the whistle, you can just simply do it without now having to go back to the workbench and download it. Um, Whistles are one of those unique things that over the years, engineers carry their own whistle. And mm -hmm. so sometimes town folk knew old Bill was running his train today because they could hear his whistle on his train. So mm -hmm. this gives you that flexibility to do it quick and on the fly. Right. So we're really excited about it. And, and it's obviously proven really good. I mean, we've got Model Railroaders Reader's Choice Award two times for favorite sound decoder. And these are available. The steam decoders have a TSU 1100, which is our smallest one, will fit into most NCL steam locomotives. Uh, the TSU 2200, which will fit into bigger steam locomotives. And I actually have a YouTube video on an installation I did here on this Broadway Mikado that shows you the step-by-step -step conversion on how to do that. So if you go to Soundtracks videos on YouTube, uh, you'll be able to see the step-by-step -step installation on this guy. And we also have a 21 pin uh, decoder that'll just plug right into your 21 pin socket and the uh, four amp decoder, which is our TSU 44 amp for O scale and larger. Oh yeah. You know, actually I need to talk to you about, I have a Climax that I picked up actually for free. It needs some work, but I think that the long-term goal for that is to have it be wireless and battery powered so that I can run it on my friend's layout in Santa Cruz and I already know that I want to use a Soundtracks decoder in it because I've heard Soundtracks decoders on, in Shays and they're ridiculously good. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something that maybe we'll do a project on and uh, maybe okay. we can get a decoder for that because there's no rush or anything on that one, but just think about that for the future. Okay, just remind me, let me know when you're ready and we'll see what we can do to get you fixed up. Yeah, for sure. And also the KN1 that I got from you, I don't know, last month, I think, will mm -hmm. be used pretty soon in a video because I'm going to be working on a P42. I'm, okay. actually do, I'm actually going to do two installs. I'm going to do the KN1 into one of the P42s. And then I think I told you before, my friend Alvin makes a motherboard for N-scale uh, locomotives that will fit into a P42 and it's an X18. So okay. he, gave me, he gave me a decoder for that that I'm just going to plug into it. And it'll be interesting because I'll have two different sound sets, which should sound pretty cool because that's what real locomotives sound like. If you have the same exact decoder in every locomotive, they'll all behave the same. It'll just sound like it's in stereo or well, quadraphonics or something. Well, that's the, that's the perception. I have a really good friend of mine. He was a, uh, a yard operator at Argentine Yard. And he told me one time, he says, George, I've tried. I've listened. I've tried to find differences. A Jeep 7 sounds like a Jeep 7 sounds like a Jeep 7. So, but that's also, you, you bring that up. There's also audio tools in our Tsunami 2 that you can adjust and make different tones. So you can have a, uh, the same recording, for example, your P42 would use the 7FDL 16 Prime Mover. But we have a product in there called Prime Mover Pitch Shift, which will take the pitch and just slightly shift it up or down, depending on your CV settings. 
And then we have a seven band equalizer. So again, all the tools to do that are built into the Tsunami 2. And that way you can have all of your locomotives sound different if you want, or they can all sound the same like the uh, yard operator at Argentine told me. Yeah, I'm glad that I brought that up then because it brought out another feature that I wasn't thinking we were planning to talk about. So that's cool. <laughs> oh, we could talk features for hours. I mean, I give an hour long yeah. clinic on just a steam locomotive. Um, and so I could talk for days on all the features of all this stuff. And so that's why we're doing this recurring is so we can get these little bits of information. And if you're looking for a lot more information, go to our YouTube channel, Soundtracks uh, Videos on YouTube, and you can search our webinar series. And the webinar series, each of those videos are about 45 minutes to an hour long, and they go into a lot more depth on a lot of the features. There's a video, there's two videos on steam locomotives alone. One is just an overview, and the other is an in-depth look at what all those sounds are, like we were talking about beginning. So those are a lot of good informational stuff. And then we've done short videos over the time. So be sure to check those out and subscribe. Yeah, I've I've poked around a little bit on the Soundtracks YouTube channel and find that there's a lot of stuff that's not even specific to soundtracks that I think helps people with their hobby. So I think what you're, yeah, what you're doing there, I think is a good thing. So I'm kind of uh, wanting to ask you, I don't know if it's time yet, but it, should I ask you about the, the offer for the viewers this month? Or? Well, we're going to go ahead and extend our TSG free which is the free shipping for your TSG viewers. So with the discount code at checkout, they type in TSG and the word free, TSG, F-R-E-E, -E, and they'll get free shipping on their, on their order. So cool. uh, check that out and um, we'll go from there. All right. Sounds good to me. Uh, do you have anything else you want to talk about or? Well, if you'd like, I can do a quick, uh, short little modeling tip for the day if you yeah. would. and I know we've talked about these doing these in the past um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move this locomotive out of the way because of what I want to talk about is wiring up of our track so what I'm going to talk about today is the frog primarily and the frog is a big wiring mess so to speak because you have basically your opposite polarity coming together and then continuing through. So it's a big source for short uh, circuits and things like that. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll go with what's called an insole frog or basically a dead frog where this whole section of track is unpowered. Well, what happens is this is a, actually a number eight turnout right here. And what happens is the longer the angle of the turnout, the longer the frog and therefore the longer the dead section. And so what happens is if you have a short wheelbase locomotive, like say a GP15 or GP7 or something like that, what can happen is the entire truck on one side is across this dead section of track. And yeah. so therefore the decoder is no longer getting power from that. So it relies on track power for the other side. But again, depending on the length of the track, you have the hinged points. And if this point is not reliably picking up track power, and I'll cover that also in a second, but if this point is not picking up track power, then you potentially have the locomotive spanning the points and your frog at the same time, therefore rendering the locomotive to die. Now, yeah. we have a product called a Current Keeper, which you can install in your locomotive, which allows up to 10 seconds of track power. So you can usually power through something like this. But if you go to, say, a yard ladder where you have multiples of these over and over again, well, when you put in a Current Keeper, a Current Keeper will give you up to 10 seconds of power, but it takes a minute and a half to charge. Uh -huh. So at some point, if you're running over a whole lot of dead spots or something like that, then eventually your current keeper can completely discharge. But here's the other side that a lot of people don't think about is that when you're living on the current keeper, you're also not receiving the track signal anymore because there's no track power, which is where the DCC signal is embedded. So if you're running through a yard ladder and you're trying to stop, but your decoder's running on the current keeper, it's just going to keep powering through. And so then you're frantically trying to reduce the throttle. So this is a really quick and simple thing that I have. These are Pico, uh, our friends over across the pond in UK, Pico, P-E-C-O. Um, these are their turnouts that I use, and these are the electro frogs. And so you'll notice that this is actually a full metal frog. Mm -hmm. Now, right here, it's, and it may be hard to see on the, on the camera, but they actually have insulating gaps right here on the frog. And then these wing rails are actually powered only to the adjacent rail. So you're only dealing with this point right here that's electrically 
uh, connected. Now there is a wire that is already soldered to it that runs down through the layout. And so what I use on these, because in a yard, in industry yard or, or, or industrial area, uh, everything's ground throws, everything's manual. And so I have these ground throws from Caboose Industries. And these actually have a small little electric switch so that when I flip the turnout, it flips the switch. And then these wires are actually wired to this frog so that I take track power, route it through the switch, and it goes right to the frog so that it makes sure that it maintains power the whole time. Hmm. So that this switch, this the frog will switch polarity. So it just takes a few seconds after you install your ground throw, determine which polarity of the rail is going to go through the frog, wire your turnout up accordingly, and go from there. This way, you don't have to worry about a dead frog. Your switch will take care of the polarity of the frog, and you can run through reliably knowing that you're getting the DCC signal and you're getting track power. Now, there's other things out there like the tortoise switch machines. I'm sure you've seen with those and a lot of your viewers are familiar. Those typically mount under the table and they have a switch like that also. Um, there's also the uh, A-Line Proto Power West makes a product called a, a Blue Point Turnout Motor and it's a manually controlled with a control rod from the side. And it basically does that from underneath and it's manually, but it also has the switches on there as well. So this way you can make sure you get track power to your frog. Now, the last thing I'll point out really quickly is when you have a hinged point like this, what happens is, is that it's a moving point. And so if dirt or crud or let's say glue from your ballast gets in there, then you potentially that point may not be getting power. And so now you're just relying on the physical contact of the points against the stock rails. And so what, you, what I usually will do, and it's, and it's too difficult to see in this particular angle, um, but where the, the hinge is at, what I'll do is I'll take a short piece of wire and solder it to the back side of the rail in a horseshoe shape and then to the back side of the point. So that that way, when the point moves, the wire moves with it. But now I have a physical wire contact between my uh, converging rails and the points so that that way everything's maintained power. And then they're electrically touching physically to the same as the stock rails. So that way you always have power through there. So the need to have current keepers on your model is greatly reduced. But also it will help enhance that current keeper because now you don't have to worry about running through a, a yard ladder and losing power halfway through it thinking what's wrong with the decoder. Right. So, but that's my tip for the day is take your time. Um, I know when we're building a layout, especially we want to take our, we want to hurry up and get our trains running. And I totally understand that mentality, but I, I want to stress from a, a, you know, professional standpoint and, you know, dealing with questions all the time, uh, take your time, wire your track, wire your turnouts, make sure you drop as many feeders as you can. Every piece of rail should have a feeder. Um, the, the, what do they always say? The ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure later on. Yep. So if after you get the scenery down, like if I had to go back and rewire this, I'd end up having to cut out some of the scenery, dig through the ballast and it becomes a mess. And then it just looks different. And uh, so I encourage taking the time and actually going through and doing this the first time. Yeah. One of the things I'll say about that is if you have a layout and you've rushed through your building process, you may end up with something that you don't like because it doesn't work and now it's not fun and if you're not having fun you might as well be doing something else right right we're all about fun and, and so these tips are designed to help you enjoy your hobby and uh you know so again take your time and, you know make sure everything's there if you have to you know take dc power and apply it to the track and make sure you've got consistent power all the way before you hook up your dcc system because then that way you can make sure that your layout is going to work reliably and well for you over the years right i want to thank you this time for the modeling tips that's something that i like because you know this isn't just soundtrack soundtracks rah 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 i mean it is but that's not all it is and mm -hmm. that's not all it's supposed to be and I really appreciate your experience with this modeling stuff because I knew what you were talking about. I've talked to other people about that before and, you know, like not relying on your, your rail to carry the, the power because it's not a reliable contact when you just push mm -hmm. it up against the other rail. So it's very cool stuff. And uh, thanks for that. And yeah. also thanks for the TSG free. I'll make sure to harp on that during the podcast. So sounds like a good plan. 
All right, cool. Hey, thanks, man. I'll see you again probably next month, unless, like I said, unless I get Nancy on. Yeah, we'll see where that goes. Uh, we do have a new support person starting uh, here uh, very soon, so we'll be getting him trained. So hopefully that'll free up a little bit more time and also give us some extra help here. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And uh, so we'll see what next month brings. Hopefully we'll be bringing out new product. Yeah, why don't we do one last thing before I say goodbye to you, which is... Give people the name, the uh, telephone number for support because I know that's another thing that we've talked about in the past. I'm not trying to pile on a bunch of stuff here, but I sure. do think it's important that people know that if they have an issue after they've checked the manual, that they should call you if they have a problem still. Because uh, it yeah, may be absolutely. something that right. So what is that number? I don't remember. It's nine seven zero something, isn't it? Correct. Now, right now, we're all still under the uh, the you know, work at home orders or, requ or recommendations or however you want to work it. But uh, right now, if you call 970-317-3505, that will dial direct to support. And then for sales questions, if you need help selecting a product is 970-317-9977. And that'll ring direct to the small uh, flip phone that I carry around with me. Okay, cool. And then of course, soundtracks.com, soundtracks with two X's. Yep. .com is the best place to get technical yep. support in written form or electronic form. Yep. Yeah. You can submit cool. a ticket on the, on our website for support requests or sales requests. You can go to the contact us and you can fill out a form right there and email it and we'll get it and we'll respond to it as fast as we can. Okay, cool. Thanks again, sir. I will see you next month. Sounds good. We'll see you then. All right. And now back to me in the studio. Thanks, George. As usual, I appreciate hearing from you and also appreciate the continued support from Soundtracks. So don't forget, when you place an order with Soundtracks, use the code TSGFREE to get free shipping. And if you prefer to patronize your local brick and mortar shops, that's okay. You can still drop Soundtracks a line and let them know that you appreciate their support of this channel. Before I get to last month's activities, I want to remind you that our affiliate link to Great US Beef Jerky is still active and you can find it in the description below. If you use the code TSG10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off the best beef jerky I've had so far this century. Try it, I think you'll like it. So let's talk about what happened since I last came to you with a podcast. So on March 13th, I went to Silicon Valley Lines to record the run-by shots for the product spotlight I did on the Scale Train's five-unit well car set that came out a couple weeks ago. Then on St. Patrick's Day, I conducted a live call-in show with my friend Jack Burgess, who was filling in for Michelle Kempema that night. The whole purpose of that show was to provide the audience with as much information as we could about the NMRA's Achievement Program. I think we did that, and I think we had some fun while we were at it. Michelle will be back for the live call-in show later this month. On the 20th, we had a TSG train crew virtual hangout. Now, what that is, is ever since the pandemic started, I've been opening up a private video conference with my Patreon supporters once a month. Sometimes we have a special guest being interviewed, and sometimes we just hang out and talk about things, share projects and the things that we've been doing, that kind of thing. And all patrons are welcome to these virtual hangouts. On the 21st, I recorded a video call with Alvin Ho. You may remember Alvin, he's been on the channel before. He's a very talented end scaler and he also makes detail parts and signal towers. Well. He designed a DCC replacement board for Cotto locomotives that allows you to use all the functions being offered in Next18 DCC decoders. You'll see later this month on a special episode of Nscale Friday. On the 24th, I conducted a short interview with Tom Shara about the Pacific Coast region of the NMRA's annual convention. Let's go to that now. All right, so I have Tom dialed up on Zoom and we're going to talk a little bit about the PCR's con yearly convention. It's also called the Sugar Pine Centennial or something like that. Right, Tom? Yes, it's the Sugar Pine Centennial because this marks the 100th anniversary of the, uh, the Sugar Pine Railroad. 
Oh, excellent. So tell us about what's going to be happening. I I know, but tell the viewers about what's going to be happening. Okay, so the the Sugar Pine Centennial is the Pacific Coast region's annual convention. And this year happens to be situated in sunny Fresno, California. Originally, it was scheduled to be a three-day mini convention. And this is in advance of the 2021 Nationals NMRA convention, which is set for July of 2021 in San Jose. Now, due to the uncertainties regarding uh, COVID restrictions and so forth, it was decided to cancel the in-person Sugar Pine Centennial and make it a one day all virtual convention. So in uh, converting the convention from a three day in-person to a one day all virtual convention, we wanted to provide as rich an experience as possible. And so rather than a conventional Zoom broadcast, we're going to try to make this as close to an in-person convention as possible in that we have a full slate of clinics, we have virtual layout tours, we have a live Q&A with layout owners, we also have a keynote speech and there will be door prize drawings. And in addition to all that, as at a real convention, where you have people gathering in hallways after clinics or after presentations and people start talking about the subjects that were just discussed or they meet with the clinician, you'll be able to do that at the virtual convention. There's going to be breakout rooms that will follow each of the clinic clinics and will follow the layout owner's Q&A and will follow the keynote speech. So this is a chance for people to get to interact uh, with the presenters, and they'll be able to meet up and talk with their friends and make new friends. So this is going to be as immersive an environment as can be made and still have it all virtual. So it's going to be a really unique event, and it's going to be a little bit of a taste of what the NMRA Nationals are going to be in July. So we're really looking forward to it. Right. I I think that's a big deal, too, because I, I think most of the reason and I can say this because I did a video on the NMRA national convention in 2019 that was held in Salt Lake city. Mm -hmm. And I can say with, with a degree of certainty that most of the people that I talked to there on and off camera said that they came to the convention and they come back to every convention for that social aspect of it. Yes. So being able to include that social aspect, instead of just having a rapid fire, basically fire hose of clinics and information with no social interactivity is a big deal. Yes. And that's uh, something that as anyone who's been to conventions and I've been to uh, plenty of events such as Bay Rails, uh, SoCal Ops and the layout design and operations SIG meets. So the major part of that is a social interaction. And so with the Sugar Pine Centennial, there's going to be multiple ways for people to be able to interact. Uh, So there's going to be breakout sessions that will follow each of the clinics and each of the layout owners and live Q and A's. So there will be basically a great hall where people can meet up and they can discuss topics. They can uh, make new friends and also renew friendships. So there will be such things as birds of a feather, which people are familiar with. So it's not going to be your typical zoom Uh, broadcast, it's going to be as interactive as possible. And that's, I think, going to be the really uh, one of the strong suits of it. Absolutely. I'm excited about that in case you couldn't tell. (laughs) (laughs) Looking forward to it. So, so this is the, just our our little uh, slide to promo so people can kind of get a better idea. So the Pacific Coast region is putting on its annual convention. And so to emphasize Uh, and to promote as much attendance as we can, uh, this meeting is open to everyone. You do not have to be a PCR member or an NMRA member to register. So the other advantage is that registration is free. I think that's also a big deal. Having something that's completely free, open to all people that you don't even have to be a member, I think is a big deal because people who aren't members may find that they want to be members too. Yes. And that's a good point that you brought up, John. Uh, We definitely would encourage membership in the NMRA. Um, NMRA has done a lot of great work. And as I think about the 
the ease with which uh, we're able to operate on any layout, thanks to DCC, for example, that was an enormous uh, engineering and logistics uh, challenge. And so NMRA really put that all together. And so there's a lot of benefits to, to membership. And at the same time, uh, we wanna make the convention open to everyone. So you do not need to be a member, you just need to sign up. Right. So this is the homepage of the Sugar Pine Centennial. So this gives you some information about the convention going all virtual. Now going to the schedule, this is what we have. We have a full slate of events. We have six clinicians who are gonna be presenting topics on everything from the basics of American steam locomotives to having virtual layout tours and a layout owner live panel Q&A. There is also going to be a clinic on the Madera Sugar Pine Railroad, the pains and pleasures of prototype modeling, focus stacking and low perspective smartphone photography. This is a really great clinic for those who don't want to invest thousands of dollars in a complex single lens reflex camera. Our keynote speaker is going to be Mike Osborne, who is a career railroader with SP and UP. And then a very unique model railroad. This is modeling the Hetch Hetchy Railroad in black and white. And you'll have to watch the presentation to see why the clinician chose to do that. And then lastly is the Sunset Railway and McKittrick Branch, documented by a clinician who was a firefighter in the area and has documented all of that railroad uh, past, present, and so it should be really good. Also, if we look over here on the right, you'll see that running parallel to the convention events is the breakout hall. And this is your chance to be able to interact with the clinicians and meet other modelers. So you have a chance to actually have the clinic go on after the clinic is over. So this is going to provide a really great interactive time for everyone who uh, attends. Yeah, I think that's important too, because I know a lot of times at the at the conventions that are in person, mm -hmm. you'll have a clinic and the questions don't all get answered in the time allotted, but you have to leave because the next clinic, clinic starts. So what do you do? A lot of times in the in-person clinics, the clinician wants to go and you know, to another clinic after he's done with his clinic. So you don't get a chance to talk to him afterwards. This lets you do that. Yes, uh, it, it's a great opportunity to meet with the clinician. And yes, it, there's always um, time for more questions. And so it's a great chance to be able to meet the clinician as well as to uh, renew friendships and to uh, make new ones. Yeah, something also that's cool about this, I think, is that this is virtual. So any there are going to be people from all over the world in this in this in this virtual convention. So say you're into something that's kind of obscure, you could possibly find other people with those same interests yeah, and start example, up new right start up new friendships. I think that's yes. pretty cool. So for example, people who uh, collect Ad Lake marker lamps that were used by the Goshen and Goose Chase Railroad back in 1892, they can, <laughs> they right. can gather for their own little session. So yeah. there are plenty of opportunity to be able to have discussions uh, after the clinics or the uh, virtual layout tours are over. So and speaking of uh, layout tours, uh, John, we have four layouts that will be featured. Two of the layouts already have videos that have been shot of them. And so those are available for viewing on the convention website right now. The other two layouts, and this would be Rob Briney's Sierra Clovis and Western and Jim Neal's SPLA division Bakersfield sub, those videos are in the process of editing and then will be posted to the convention website. Very cool. I know the guy who did one of those videos. Is that somebody named John Abaticola? He's a hack job. I know that guy. Hopefully, uh, uh, you won't have. Maybe your... we can get maybe we can get a good video before then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll put in a, a good word for this uh, John Abaticola guy. How about that? <laughs> yeah, we're we're having fun here because Tom and I are the ones that are going to be hosting this Q and A thing, so it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, the layouts the, the layouts being uh, featured here look like look to be really nice ones. I know for sure that uh, at least two of them are excellent. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the two you're doing. Actually, I think right. 
all four are actually really high quality layouts. And so, John, you'll be uh, interviewing Glenn Sutherland and Bob Jekyll on their layouts. Right. And I'll be interviewing Rob Briney and Jim Neal on their layouts. So yeah. I've been involved in the construction and operation of the Sierra Clovis and Western and the SPLA division. Oh, very cool. And I've, I've known Glenn Sutherland for a number of years now, and I had a chance to meet Bob Jekyll last year when I went to the area to do the layout tour of Glenn Sutherland's layout. And uh, I'll tell you something, Bob Jekyll's layout is huge. It's O scale, which is something we don't see a lot of. And he has his own dedicated outbuilding. Well, everybody will learn more about it during the, the Q and A, but uh, it's definitely worth even just, you know, it may be a little self-serving Tom for me to say this, but Oh, even, go ahead, just, <laughs> even just, well, I mean, it's, it's self-serving for both of us. Even just this event will be worth coming to the convention. <laughs> oh, this, this will be worth the price of admission. Even though the price of admission is free, you'll, you'll definitely get your money's worth. <laughs> That's worth twice as much. <laughs> it's a great value. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely bring the whole family. So, Hey, just if we could, I'd like to uh, do a couple of a quick uh, views of the the four layouts that will be featured on the layout owner live panel q a if that's okay with you john sure yeah okay so rob briney's sierra clovis and western represents the branch lines of the sp and the santa fe radiating out of fresno california so this is a double deck ho scale railroad designed for operations a video is being produced for rob briney's sierra clovis and western railroad and that uh, video layout tour should be ready and on the convention website by the end of March. So the next layout is Bob Jekyll's O scale masterpiece. And this is one that John, you're going to be doing a video of pretty soon. Is that correct? Yeah, we have plans. Uh, I'm still waiting for my COVID vaccine, but once I get my vaccine, a trip to Mariposa is in order. And that's where this layout is. There's actually, I think two or three layouts that when I make that trip, we'll be doing, but this is definitely one of those. And uh, it's a very impressive. I have seen it in person. Yes, there's about um, three to four, and no, maybe more, just really high quality layouts up in the Mariposa area. And so all these guys have their own ro round robin group. And right. So they built some very high quality railroads. So the next one is Jim Neal's Southern Pacific LA division in Bakersfield Sub. And so I've known Jim since 1999, and he's an excellent model railroader. This is his third layout. And so this is the SP from Bakersfield to Mojave with, of course, trackage rights by Santa Fe. So the video for this layout is in progress and should be up on the convention website by the end of March. Okay. So check back with the website often to see uh, when those uh, videos are available, and this will give you a good idea of the layout, uh, its design, inspiration, and so on. And then the last layout is Glen Sutherland Sierra Railway, set in 1923. This layout has a very professionally done video done by TSG Multimedia. So that's available on the convention website right now, so you can view that. And then John Abatacola is going to be interviewing Glenn Sutherland as part of the live panel Q&A during the convention. Cool. Looking forward to that. Our keynote speaker for the Sugar Pine Centennial is Mike Osborne. I've known Mike for about 10 years, and he is a professional railroader. He has worked for the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific on its L.A. division, and he's worked every corner of the L.A. division. He's going to be telling us what it was like when he was a newly minted brakeman on SP's LABRF, a nighttime run from Los Angeles to Bakersfield. So as a new brakeman, he had a lot of responsibilities. And so he's going to be telling us what that was like, uh, taking the trip, starting in Taylor Yard, picking up the uh, power, uh, running through that maze of switches and signals at night from Taylor Yard on the west bank of the LA River, crossing the LA River to LATC, picking up the train, and then dealing with the trip, the herders, interlockings, train orders, dispatchers, and being able to operate the train safely all the way from LA to Bakersfield via San Fernando Valley, 
Soledad Canyon, Mojave Desert, over the Hatchby Loop, and finally into Bakersfield. So this was a, a, quite a journey. And so we're going to get to see this journey as he narrates it through his eyes. That's really cool. Hearing from real railroaders is always fun. Yes. And Mike will be available after his uh, keynote speech to be able to answer questions from our guests on the uh, convention. So it should be a really good time. Also, I should note that Mike is a very, very skilled model railroader, and he's built a proto freelance SP in Santa Fe layout in his garage. And I've operated on it uh, two times, and it's a, a really fun layout. And you can see how he's applied his knowledge as a professional railroader to how his model railroad operates. So for those who are really interested in operations-oriented model railroading, you'll definitely want to see the keynote speech. Registration for the Sugar Pine Centennial is easy. You just go to the registration page here, and I should note that registration is free. It's open to anyone. You do not need to be a member of the PCR or the NMRA, although membership is encouraged because the NMRA does a lot of good things for the hobby, but you do not need to be a member to register. Also, in order to be able to be eligible for one of the three door prizes, you need to be registered and you need to be online in order to be granted access to the Zoom webinars and to the Great Hall breakout rooms. Also, I should mention that, let's go here, let's see, here's the registration page. So it's easy. Uh, your information is not sold to anybody. It's all held confidentially. So registration is open and it is free. Uh, I also should mention that there are going to be door prizes that will be awarded during the broadcast. In order to be eligible to win the door prizes, you do need to be registered and you need to be online. But remember, registration is free. And we have some really good door prizes. They are gift certificates to Central Coast trains over in Atascadero. Now, you do not need to be physically present at Atascadero to use the gift certificates. The gal who runs Central Coast Trains will honor them via phone call or email. Oh, cool. And so, John, I don't know if you're familiar with Central Coast Trains, but uh, she can get any model railroad product from any manufacturer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. And I know a lot of these places have been doing a lot of phone order or online business simply because of the COVID, so. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a really good deal. And so currently we have two $25 gift certificates to Central Coast Trains and also a $50 gift certificate, which we're considering upping to $100. Oh, nice. We've had some donations thanks to generous uh, people who had registered for the in-person event, and then they just donated their registration fee to the PCR. So we're going to hopefully increase the gift certificate amounts. So I think that should sort of sweeten the pot and encourage people to register. Sure. And again, you do not need to be a member of the PCR or NMRA to register. Anyone is invited to attend and everyone is welcome. So that's Saturday, April 24th for the one day virtual convention from Fresno. I can't say anything else. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tom, for talking to us. I've been helping with the planning for this convention, and it's looking like it'll be a good one. We're making a concerted effort to include social aspects that the in-person conventions have that haven't really been reproduced in any of the online events that I've seen. It's also a test run for the NMRA National Convention that's coming up in July. That's also going to be virtual. Now, I want to talk about the National Convention for just a minute, okay? Just to be sure that everyone understands what's going on. The in-person convention was called off because of all the uncertainty around the pandemic. We didn't know what the condition would be, and we didn't know what the county health orders would be by then. So we decided not to do an in-person one. It was the right decision, considering how things looked when it was made. So instead of an in-person convention... 
we're going full steam ahead with an online convention. I mentioned a minute ago that the PCR convention was sort of a preview of the national convention in that we're focused on providing a social interaction as well as the excellent clinics and other content that you expect from a regular convention. So it should be really good. The content is going to be there. I'll have more information about that as it becomes available in the coming months. I just wanted to make sure that everyone who watches knows that the convention has not been completely canceled. We're simply changing the venue to online to accommodate for the pandemic. That means you can attend for a fraction of the cost, but still enjoy most of the socializing that you get when you go to an in-person convention and all of the really good clinic content that you get at a real convention. So anyway, also on the 24th, I saw the official announcement that the Napa Valley Model Railroad Club lost their legal fight to remain in the building that they occupied for the last several decades in Napa. These buildings are actually being demolished to make space for a parking lot. Can you imagine that? You can see the layout tour that we did there a little over a year ago by clicking on the link that just appeared in the top right corner of your screen if you're watching on a computer. On Friday the 26th, I attended a live panel discussion on Nordell Drew's channel where we talked about the future of the hobby and lots of other stuff. I want to thank Drew for having me on. It was a lot of fun. And right after that, I joined my friends at Silicon Valley Lines for a virtual operating session. That was cool, too. I mean, I got to run a train on the layout from, you know, 12 or 15 miles away from the comfort of my own laptop. I was actually sitting in my bed. I've talked about Silicon Valley Lines and their virtual e events before, and I'm pretty sure they're planning for a virtual open house sometime really soon. And I think if you go to SiliconValleyLines.com, you can find more information about what they're doing. So on the 28th, I talked with Dave Houston about his upcoming book, which is all about the Southern Pacific route from Los Angeles to Bakersfield in the 1930s through the 1950s. So let's go to that now. Okay, so I have Dave dialed up on a Zoom call. Hello, Dave, long time no see, how are you? Good, John, how about yourself? Doing good, I think. I'm just good. waiting for just waiting for COVID to be over. <laughs> it uh, couldn't be over fast enough to suit any of us. Right, I think we've all been waiting for that. <laughs> But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, people will remember you from, we did a layout tour at your uh, layout. That was a great layout. That was about, I think, two or three years ago. And at the time, you were in the process of, or had just recently finished releasing this book, the Southern Pacific Volume 1, Sacramento to Sparks, the story behind the picture. And recently, I was on... Uh, Facebook, and I saw that you have another one coming out. So I thought it was a kind of a good idea to maybe talk about it and get the word out. So that's what we're here to talk about. And I'm kind of curious what what brought this on. <laughs> well, I actually enjoyed the process. The uh, restoring the photographs, uh, sharing them with people, going to a, era, a, a period of time when they weren't there. I, I really enjoy sharing that with people. The historical aspect of railroading has always fascinated me, and this became a really great vehicle to show people what was here at a point in time. Right. Now, the, the title of the new book is Southern Pacific 1930s to 1950s, Los Angeles to Bakersfield, and then the story behind the picture. It's the longest title, Dave, I think I've seen other than this one. <laughs> but uh, but I do have a question though. And, and I know one of the first things I noticed when I saw the title to this book, besides being a different region, which makes sense because you wouldn't probably want to cover the same region again. But I noticed that you changed eras too. You went from the 30s to the 50s instead of from the 60s to the 90s. What brought that on? Well, I managed to find a time machine and I went back in time and became older. Right. 
So what really no. happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole process started with my own collection that I was scanning, and that covers the era of the first book, the 60s to the 90s. Right. I remember that conversation. With, yeah. I worked very closely with the publisher, Joe Shine from Four Ways West. And after the first book, he says, look, I've got all these pictures that I've collected from all these photographers. And it was his goal to do a book, but he's so busy doing books for others. He said, would you do it? Hmm. I'll give you my collection. I'll give you access to the greatest photographers that ever lived. Would you do the same thing and tell their story? And I thought that was an honor that he would do that. And um, the subject of Tehachapi, well, that growing up in Los Angeles, that was where I went every single weekend that I could get away, camping on the loop, camping at Caliente, Bealville. I absolutely love that place. And uh, I still do. Um, so he gave me photographs that go back. There's 52 of the greatest photographers that ever captured trains on film. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, I, I covered the, the big steam engines, the, the beautiful cab forwards, daylights, and then the, the diesels come out with all of the, the colors, the Black Widows and all that. Uh, it let me capture an era before I ever got there. And it's right. what I would have loved to have seen if I could have taken a time machine back. I would love to have known what was there. And this became the... The vehicle to share that I learned and I explored and then I get to share with everybody that's that's of a similar interest the way it was. That's awesome. You know, I've often thought that it would be a really cool thing to stand next to a cab forward that was live. I never got to do that. I don't even know. I mean, I've heard recordings, but you know, it, it's never the same on a recording nope. as it nope. is right? Being next to the real thing. So, but uh, that's really cool. And I noticed that the cover has the 44, 49. Well, I think it's the 44, 49. I haven't blown it up. Yes, enough it to is. See. is it? it sure and I is. also, right. And I also noticed your picture that you're using as a backdrop has you at the controls of the, well, I mean, you are daylight Dave. So I guess that kind of makes sense, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go off script here because I have some questions I was going to ask you, but I did want to ask you about that picture at some point. Is there a story behind that, right? You bet. Um, ever since the 4449 was brought back to life, I've been following it. And I've been an avid fan, photographer. And then through my previous company that I sold, Daylight Sales, I became the purveyor for their gift shop for all of their activities. And as such... Since 1995, if that engine ran, I was on board as the revenue arm to help support the train. Ah. I found something I could do to help them since I wouldn't know, you know, don't put a wrench or a welding torch in my hand, I'll hurt myself. <laughs> it's just not my forte, but I could run a gift shop for them and make money to keep that locomotive running. And it became just immensely gratifying. I okay. rode with far as Michigan when we took it back there and um, thousands and thousands of people came out. So consequently, I've become part of the crew. When it runs, I'm there. Um, and uh, in that picture, the train runs every December uh, on a short run. They call it the Holiday Express. It runs out of the Oregon Rail Heritage Center in Portland. Mm -hmm. And it goes down the river by Oaks Park, where the engine was on display for years after it was donated. It runs back and forth, and people get to ride a slow ride. The train's all decorated for Christmas, and it's a wonderful experience. And they let me sit up there in the cab because they know I love it. That's and awesome. That engine's been something I've always loved, and uh, to be part of it in any way I could contribute has just been very, very gratifying. I'm glad I asked that question because I just learned something about you that I didn't even know. So that's uh -oh. really cool. No, I just, I didn't realize <laughs> that. I didn't realize that you have that access to, to the machine. I think that's pretty cool. Not many people can say that they've even been up in the cab, let alone, you know, seen it live. So that's great. I feel very fortunate. The, the yeah. people up 
Doyle and the crew, they've been very kind to me and welcome me and given a home where I could do something to help them. And in turn, it made me very, very, it was very fulfilling. That's really great. I'm glad I asked, you know, I considered not asking because, you know, I'm always worried about how long things are going to be, but I'm glad that I did. So we should switch back to the book though, because that's really what we're here to talk about. And so my understanding is that you're still in the process of editing. And is there a, an expected time for release of this new book? Yes. The editing should be done within the next two weeks after six months of digesting this thing over and over to make sure that it is correct. I have employed fact checkers, proofreaders, uh, retired railroad engineers, uh, uh, grammar uh, people that uh, the um, writing conventions of how things should be done to be consistent have. Uh, it's been a real learning curve for me because you know to, to have a thought and to spell it out and have it be consistent and correct. Those are non sequiturs for some of us. Yeah, it comes easily for some, but not for me. Mm -hmm. I, I love the tools I've been able to use with Photoshop to restore pictures uh, and the research to find out about the history of what went on in certain areas. I love that. But getting the words down and writing correctly, uh, I found that I, I fell short of my own expectations on the first book. And I made a pledge I would not do that again. So right. this book is going to be a perfect, uh, correct book, grammar, spelling, the whole nine yards. I'm proudest punch and it should be out by summertime maybe early summer okay but, uh, the process of all this proofing is going to be done uh, as we get into early april then it goes to the printer right now i know that the other book since i have it here with me uh, was i don't know I, i'm not counting the pages i think it was around 140 150 pages is this Correct. next book about the same or same thing 144 pages oh okay. it'll be the same Price at uh, fifty nine ninety five. Okay. Uh, there are four hundred and fifty photographs in there, and uh, a lot of color, but there's a lot of black and white also. But the quality of the pictures is just phenomenal. You know, one of the greatest things a photographer, uh, somebody who's doing books like this, has is Photoshop, mm -hmm. because to, to adjust the colors and then washed out, sharpened the dirt and things. To be able to restore these pictures is really, really incredible. It's it's a reward of its own. So did you do all the restoration yourself then? You bet. Whoa, wow. That's a lot of work. Wow. Yeah, we all have been through this, this uh, horrific shutdown with COVID, and I used a lot of my time. This became like a salvation. Right. If I so it's... I kind couldn't of do anything, couldn't go anywhere. I put on the daytime pajamas and came into the office and went to work. Right. So it's kind of your COVID project. It definitely has been. Right. <laughs> I know I know a lot of guys with layouts have been doing work on their layouts or work on models that they don't normally have time for, but they did during COVID. You wrote a book, even though you have a layout. <laughs> I ran the layout too. <laughs> oh, so you did both. I mean, but I guess, you know, that's a lot of time that you had. So you might as well do what you enjoy. I spent mornings doing one thing and afternoons doing the other. And, you know, I got through it. And with right. flying, thank God well, we're okay. Hope you uh, are too. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, I noticed you're still smiling. So it must have been all right. <laughs> right. So I do have another question, which is, has to do with the availability. Now, I know that the last time... Uh, People were order, ordering them directly from you, right? Because they wanted to get the autographs and all that stuff. Are you going to be doing the same thing? Or is it going to be on Amazon? Or where can people get it? Uh, in order directly through me, uh, through my email address. Uh, and there's a, uh, the, it can be autographed if you would like. And through the end of April, there's a, a little sale, $5 off and free shipping. Oh, so you're they taking pre-orders now? Yes, we're taking pre-orders are coming in. Okay. Uh, they will be available in bookstores and museums. And I imagine the internet will have it because a lot of the book dealers do put it out on Amazon and eBay and things like that. Okay. Uh, Fort Ways West, the publisher also can sell you a book. It just won't have an autograph. Right. But um, yeah, we're, 
it'd be fun to get as many out there as, as possible, but, um, you know, I well, will have available for you and uh, autographed if you'd like. Okay. And maybe we should let people know what the email address is so that they ah. can email you if they want one. Well, that maybe would a good be, idea, right? Maybe. Can you imagine? They call me Daylight Dave. So that's my email address. And then tack on 4449, just like in the picture. Daylight Dave 4449 at gmail.com. Oh, that's easy to remember. Yep. You take yeah. uh, Visa, PayPal, whatever way you like to work. Uh, okay. Send an email and I'll instruct you on how to proceed from there and we'll get you lined up. Sounds like a plan. So I do have one more question, if that's okay. You have time sure. for one more? Of course. Okay. So what's next? I mean, you're going to have to do another book, right? This is a <laughs> thing. Well... You know, I retired so I could start working again, right? <laughs> that's not, that's sort of the rumor. <laughs> Except that these are labors of love. So uh, I've already got the next book well underway, and it'll cover the SP uh, from Portland down to Alturas and Black Butte. It'll come down that far. It will start in the uh, in the 30s and 40s, but concentrate on the... Um, 70s through the 90s. I have two friends who are exquisite photographers and they have not had their work published. And I will be presenting their works and uh, they are masters at what they've done. They're just incredible. I'm really honored that they would allow me to put their works out there. The book will be a tribute to a childhood friend of mine who passed away way too early. He was friends with these other two fellows also. So we have a common bond. His name was Mike Devlin. And I grew up with him in Santa Monica. And we were real fan buddies. Wherever I went, I took him. And he uh, was a, a, a fun guy. And then he became friendly with all these other people that I've been, uh, who've contributed to the book. So it's a tribute. But it's, an, going, it's yeah. going to go right up until the end of the SP. And it is, is phenomenal. I think that's a really nice story, actually. A nice, uh, you know, a good reason to do a book. I, I also had a, a friend die recently, and uh, he died at the ripe old age of 57 and mm. uh, almost almost made it to his 58th birthday, but fell short by about nine or 10 days. And uh, I've been thinking about that a lot. So it's a touching story, actually, Dave. And uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing that, too. I feel like I'm ending this on a somber note. I don't mean to do that. I'm just, I'm really excited for this new book. And uh, I may be, you know, sending you an email soon to, to find out about getting one. So okay. <laughs> I thank you for your time once again. Uh, it's always good talking to you. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for doing the original book and this new book too. I think that's uh, great and hope you get a lot of sales. Great. Thank you for what you do. These, uh, these uh, interviews you put out there are a great, uh, you do a great service for the railroad hobbyist. And I thank you. Oh, well, thanks for that. I appreciate it. I'll you talk bet. to you soon. Right. Okay, buddy. Take care. I got Dave's first book about Southern Pacific over Donner Pass when I visited him about two years ago. And it's really good. It has tons of great photos and a lot of information about what's in the photos throughout the book. I can't wait to see this next one. So thanks, Dave, for talking to us. Really appreciate that. Now, right after I talked with Daylight Dave, we went live with the TSG Live Crew Lounge for last month. And in that episode, we talked about model railroad layout traffic management. It was a good conversation that not only covered dispatching approaches, but it also talked about signaling and even some talk about layout design. I'm really grateful to know so many knowledgeable people who enjoy sharing their knowledge with the world. It makes those panel discussions really good. And now for some of the comments and questions from last month. On a product spotlight episode, GM Cliff 555 asked, after you spotlight the products, what do you do with them? And then he continues, have you purchased all of them or have to return them to a store? And the answers to these questions are, first off, 
Most spotlighted models get added to my personal collection. Sometimes I donate them or give them to friends, and sometimes I sell them. Most models in spotlights are sent as product samples by the manufacturers who make them. Some of them are also borrowed. And of course, if I borrow something, I'll return it back to my friend, you know, whoever it was that let me borrow it. You can tell when I borrowed a model because I usually thank the person who let me use it during the spotlight or at the end of the spotlight, I'll have it in the credits. One such example just came out recently. It was that five unit well car from Scale Trains that I borrowed from my friend James. Not only did I borrow that model, but I also borrowed his club's layout to record the run by shots that were included at the end. And I just told you about that a few minutes ago when I went to Silicon Valley Lions earlier last month. I wanna go back to the first part of this question for just a second about getting the models in the first place. What you need to realize is that when a company sends a model to me to do a spotlight, it takes a lot of time and expertise to produce a professional, it's kind of like a marketing piece really for them. And I think they realize that because you know, a model that costs $40 on, on the market probably the video for that model being spotlighted would cost them hundreds of dollars if they were paying for it. And the same goes, especially for locomotives. You know, people might be like, oh, well, you got a $280 locomotive for free or something. You have to remember also that I'm putting in a lot of time and using the expertise that I've developed over many years to re reproduce the product spotlight in focus, you know, with sound that you can hear, well lit, all that stuff. And that would probably end up costing a company, you know, like Atlas or, you know, whoever, probably 1200 bucks or more if they actually paid someone like me to produce it. The real winner though for these is you guys, because you get to see what you're getting before you get it and know how interested you are based on the fact that you can actually see everything in focus and well lit and all that. So it's just something to think about. One of my favorite questions this month comes from Brian. And I'm gonna leave out his last name. Let's just call him Brian Downer. This is what he said. <laughs> I couldn't get two minutes into the video without getting four commercials. If I wanted to watch commercials, I'd watch broadcast TV. Thumbs down. Well, Brian, without commenting about how negative and whiny you sound, I'll just say that the way I see it, you have a few options. You could just skip through the ads that you're complaining about, probably like most people do, or you could pay for YouTube Premium. That lets you watch YouTube with no ads at all. Or better yet, you could become a supporter on Patreon. Patrons on this channel get a lot of ad-free content and it's even in 4K ultra high definition most of the time. I'd say give that one a try. I'm sure that'll make you feel better. The Horseman asked, are there any sources or sites that could give track layout ideas? Absolutely. Conduct a Google search for something like model railroad layout design. That should get you a lot of hits. Another excellent resource is the Layout Design Special Interest Group, or LDSIG. As a member of LDSIG, you get their quarterly journal that has all kinds of excellent information about layouts and layout design. They also have a page on Facebook that has a lot of great info. The last question I'll answer comes from Jeff Young, who wants to know if the Southern Pacific engines with the yellow rectangle background are now UP. This came from the Day at Stockton video that was published last month, and the answer is yes. When UP took over SP, some of the locomotive numbers that UP was already using ended up making duplicates. Well, a railroad prefers not to have duplicates because that can end up being hard to keep track of which one is where and which one is which. So they renumber one or the other, usually the one that was acquired in the takeover. Renumbers can happen other ways as well, but when you see a Southern Pacific locomotive with a yellow patch, that's what you're looking at. We refer to those as patched units, and they're fairly unusual to catch nowadays. So if you ever see one, make sure you get a picture or a video of it, because it's a good catch. 
And I want to mention that a lot of the heritage railroads are starting to open up a bit now that the COVID vaccine is starting to be widely administered. For example, in my area, the Niles Canyon Railway, uh, Roaring Camp, and Billy Jones Wildcat Railroad all have made announcements of their upcoming events. I would encourage you to please go to your favorite Heritage or Tourist Railroads website in your area to find out what's happening. Also, let me say this to you. Get out there and ride. Support them. Make an additional donation if you can afford it. These organizations have been particularly hard hit by the pandemic and they have lost almost a whole year of revenue because they had to be closed. They didn't have a choice in the matter. So anyway, now for this month's program schedule. On April 9th, that's next Friday, we have a product spotlight. On April 10th, the next installment of Model Trains Galore comes out. Then on the 11th at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, I'll be hosting a special panel discussion to talk about the Sugar Pine Centennial. That's the Pacific Coast region of the NMRA's annual convention that I talked about a little earlier in this podcast. During this discussion, we'll have people on hand to answer any questions that you might have about attending the event virtually. On the 16th, it's N-Scale Friday. On the 17th, we have a product spotlight. Then on Wednesday, the 21st, at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, I'll be joined by my co-host, Michelle Kempema, for our next live call-in talk show. Our main topic for that show will be, What Do You Like About Trains? On the 23rd, it's a product spotlight. Then on the 24th, Model Railroad with Jack Burgess returns. And finally, on the 25th, at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, it's the TSG Live Crew Lounge. Our topic will be young people in the hobby. And now for catches of the month. TSG train crew member Michelle Kempema sends in this video of a southbound train led by UP number 1996, the Southern Pacific Heritage Unit. Great shot, Michelle. The light was especially good on that one. This next shot is from my friend Dave Adams. I had to call him because I didn't know how to pronounce the name of the station. It's spelled O-S-I-E-R, and we think it's either Ozier or Oozier. I told Dave I'd just say it was taken on the Combrus and Toltec in Colorado in 2017. We agreed that would work best. We both know how to say Colorado. If you know how to pronounce that name, let us know in the comments below. This photo comes from Paul Kruper, and it's in the category of, what is it? What we do know is that it's a Sierra locomotive, but what we're not sure about is which one. It was taken in 1979. If you know which one it is, let us know. This next shot is Paul's newest addition to his narrow gauge locomotive roster. Looking pretty sharp there, Paul. This last shot is from Sean Koga, who's working on a project. It's his HO scale SD45-2. It's a Santa Fe Kodachrome unit, number 5809. And there's actually two shots here. They are uh, shots of the LEDs that he's testing as he's installing his Soundtrack Tsunami 2 EMD2 decoder. It's looking good, Sean. Make sure you send a photo of that locomotive when it's all done. And in a shocking turn of events, I did not receive any photos or videos from our Australian viewers this month. They seem conspicuously absent, and I do miss them. So, guys, send some more in for next month. Love those Australian trains. So thanks to everyone who shared this month. If you have a photo you'd like to share, please email it to podcast at tsgmultimedia.com. Be sure you own the photo and let me know the what's, when's, and where's of the shots you want to share. All right, that's all I have for you this month. I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of our excellent Patreon supporters. You see them in the credits every month, and I thought it would be appropriate to thank all of you for your generous support, and in many cases, friendship as well. It makes what we do here possible, and it makes life better by getting to know that there are kind people out there who care about the same things that we care about. Thank you all very much. Your support means the world to us here at TSG Multimedia. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.